first uh, talk in the series of lectures on topic 50 for automorphisms of K groups by Marek Faruba from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and for everybody who joined today. Um, this is the first uh, of the two lectures uh, about property T for um, the automorphism of the free group. But uh, I will not be really focusing on the, uh, the automorphism group. I will be more focusing more on the, uh, on the general technique and leave the automorphism groups for the theater for the second. All right, so this is a joint work with um, David Kielak, Piotr Novak, and Naru Takaozawa. Uh, and we were, we were going to start very, uh, uh, very simply by asking ourselves what positivity is. And then we are going to discuss some practical matters. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a definition of property T, which is I learned specifically for this lecture, so it's not going to be a general introduction to property T. And then uh, will be some uh, examples, and maybe, if time permits, we're going to see some, uh, some later topics. All right, so positivity. So here's a, uh, in, an introductory question. We start with a polynomial, very simple object, real polynomial, F, in one of several variables, and we want to ask when f is a globally non-negative, a globally non-negative polynomial, right? And uh, we can see very clearly that it's very easy to refute this, the claim of positivity. I mean, I find one point where the value of this polynomial is negative, and then we see, okay, this is not non-negative. Um, but the question is, does there exist a witness that is also going to be so easy to verify? That is going to prove us to us that this polynomial is positive or non-negative. I'm going to use positivity and non-negativity as a as a synonym. But, right? So we have these two. Uh, we can look at this from two different sides. One of them is analytic. We look at polynomial not as an element of the ring. Uh, but as a function, and then the value, the values determine the positivity or not. Or we can look at uh, polynomial as an algebraic thing, and then the question is, is there a structure of this polynomial that are going to tell us this polynomial is definitely non-negative, right? So as I told you, it's very simple. So we begin in the, in the secondary school. We have this beautiful polynomial, ax squared plus bx plus c. And we clearly know that this guy is going to be greater or equal than zero if these two algebraic invariants are satisfied. Okay. Very well. And we can also say that a polynomial f admits a sum of squares decomposition. If f can be written as a sum of squares of some real polynomials. And of course, if I can find such a decomposition, then f must be non-negative. Okay. And of course, one is just the other thing, because if I have this polynomial, I can write it always like this. And this is going to be a sum of squares of two real polynomials, even only if, and then I have to see, oh, A has to be bigger than zero, and this guy also has to be uh, real. So it's the same thing, really, it's the same thing. Very well. And um, like this problem of uh, asking if a polynomial is positive or not is not very is not very new. Hilbert in 1888 asked the same question, and he also found the uh, found the necessary and sufficient conditions, namely a non-negative polynomial is a sum of squares. So this is my notation for the set of sum of squares. Uh, if and only if it's a univariate polynomial, or it's a bivariate, or it's a quadratic polynomial in arbitrary, arbitrary number of, of variables, or it's a bivariate quartic, so there are two variables and the degree is four. Okay. So you might ask, so are there any examples of, let's say, three variables or two variables and degree six? Okay. And here is an example. 
we take uh, x to the fourth y squared, x squared y fourth, minus three x squared y squared plus one. And this guy is non-negative, which is also a high school exercise, uh, but it's not a sum of squares, which is maybe a more like more advanced, but not, not really um, that hard, right? Um, what I would like to point out here is uh, the different dates, right? So this is 1967, this is 1888. Hilbert proved the existence of those polynomials, but he didn't find a single one, which is deceptively simple. And just to, uh, to finish this, this part of the story is that the full theorem or the full solution to the Hilbert 17th problem uh, was given by Artin, who said that an everywhere non-negative polynomial P is a sum of squares of rational, which might look strange. What does it mean? A polynomial is sum of squares of rational functions. But you should think of this, that there is some kind of, um, if I multiply by all of the denominators uh, in this sum of squares, then I'm multiplying by something that is already a square. So that means that if for every such a polynomial, there will be exists Another one, which I, if I uh, multiply by the square of it, it will become sum of squares. And here is a simple example. If we take this Motskin polynomial and I multiply it by x squared plus y squared plus one, it becomes a sum of squares. So nice. Maybe even surprising. And for me, it's even still surprising. All right, <clears throat> so we have these two flavors of positivity. One is the analytic positivity. Uh, when we look at values, we are going to see what's, what is going to happen to this one. The other one is algebraic positive positivity when we look at uh, sum of squares structure. And there's a whole genre of, of theorems relating one positivity to the other. The first one was start, started by Hilbert, which is the uh, which we have seen. But they are in general called positive terms. That's a, they could happen in in different rings or in different algebras. Um, but they can also we here we also we started with saying f is a globally non-negative. But what happens if I want to say this is a polynomial that is non-negative only on a fixed algebraic? So there is a whole uh, theory behind. And now um, the, this difference in dates and that we have seen is the next thing that I want to address. Namely, in this talk, I'm really interested in practicality. So it's not only that I want to prove the existence or I want to prove that some of them are. No, I have one particular, or will have one particular polynomial and I really want to find one particular sum of square decomposition for this guy. So the question is, how do we do it? And one of the ways is uh, through linear algebra, right? So uh, sometimes it is possible that if, if I have a polynomial, I can write it as a quadratic function of monomials. So what does it mean? That means that I, I have some bases consisting of monomials, and then I have some matrix inside here, and then I have the same bases transposed consisting of monomials. No, this is here only a sub-basis. Most of the entries in this matrix will be zero. So I just pick the non-zero ones. And then I can write this polynomial as, well, quadratic form with this matrix associated to this basis. Um, and we can see here that this matrix has one degree of freedom. I mean, I picked this polynomial so that it is constructed like this. Uh, and this matrix P is going to be called a gram matrix for this polynomial with this basis. And the very simple um, lemma from linear algebra says that the polynomial is a positive definite uh, uh, quadratic form or admits a sum of squares of the composition if there exists a positive semi-definite gram matrix for some basis for this polynomial. And here what happens is that I have this, this, uh, this gram matrix, 
and I specify, okay, let me pick lambda equal to six. So this is this one. And now this one is a positive semi-definite. So I know that there exists another matrix Q, so that's QT, Q is equal to T. So this is my, my matrix Q. And out of this matrix Q, I can read off my sum of squares decomposition. Namely, I just look at the rows of this matrix and I look at the, the bases, this one, and I evaluate those guys. And then I say, I see that this is 2xy plus y squared. So this is the first one. And the second row is the second. It's very simple, very straightforward. All right. And of course, Q is not unique, uh, especially in the rank deficient case. Here we see that this is rank deficient. So um, uh, maybe one more thing that I want to say is that the number of squares equals to the rank of Q. The whole story here is that I'm given something that looks like a polynomial, and then I treat it as a quadratic form. And then the whole thing is about searching for the right basis in which the ground matrix a gram matrix for this polynomial is positive semi -definite. All right, so how to do it in practical terms? Because this is a contrived example, namely I pick the polynomial, well, no, proof to be told, I pick the sum of squares decomposition and I reverse engineered everything else, right? Um, but so normally we start with a different thing, right? Uh, I'm given this polynomial and the question is, can I find it? So uh, how do we do it? And of course, we are not going to look at polynomials that are five coefficients. We are going to be looking at polynomials which are huge. Um, and uh, one tool to do, it, to do this is uh, to do mathematical programming. So what is mathematical programming? Uh, it's a general term to describe some convex optimization routines. Uh, one of them, probably the best well-known, is linear programming, when we want to optimize a linear functional over a set constrained by hyperplanes. Okay. So this uh, set is called polytope. And then there is a second iteration of this one, uh, more related to metrical uh, things, when we want to optimize, again, a linear functional on a polytope, so set constrained by hyperplanes, intersected with a cone of a PSD matrix. What does it mean? I just want to say, you know, some of the unknowns are going to form a matrix which I want to be semi-positive definite. Uh, and this semi-definite programming is something that we'll use to, 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 to find those sum of squares decomposition in large scale. So um, here is a text uh, because, you know, if you've never seen this, then it might look very abstract, but it's actually very simple or very concrete. Um, so here is a textbook definition. So what I want to do is I, I have this uh, set of variables, P, which is also can be for, also forms a matrix. And I want to maximize some linear functional. So this is a dot product. And then I want to say that this matrix is positive semi-definite. And then I want to say that, you know, like if I take this, those unknowns P and I, uh, again, dot product them with some other known uh, vectors or matrices, then I get some known values. And again, here's the same thing. We have this polynomial. And then we say, is it always non-negative? And then we, we relax this, this question to the question of, does there exist a sum of squares for this polynomial, the composition? And this one corresponds to the existence of a PSD matrix P, such that our polynomial can be written as a uh, quadratic form. Okay. And here, what are, what are these objects here? So for example, if I look at this x, x, t dot p, and then I look at x, x, t, and this gives me all possible monomials or products of two monomials. And then what I want to say is that, you know, at x to the fourth, f is equal to four. So this matrix is going to select this one entry from my p, which is three by three. And I'm going to say the first entry of this matrix, it must be equal to four. So that's precisely 
It's very concrete, very simple, very easy to NG. All right. And now, because we are dealing with property T, we have to leave the simple world of polynomials where everything is commutative. And now we have to enter into the world of non-commutative things, right? Um, because we'll be dealing with groups, which, as we know, sometimes are non-commutative. So when we have a non-commutative algebra, not a polynomial algebra, but now non-commutative star algebra, what is the cone of sum of squares? Okay. So sum of squares, I can no longer write uh, Q squared or uh, F squared. Um, because I have this involution, the star, uh, in my algebra. So this is the proper generalization of this thing. Uh, and one should note that if I have an element here, then if I apply the star involution to it, it's going to stay here. Right? Because the star is going to switch these two, and then uh, star is going to cancel with itself. And uh, if you see if you see this definition for the first time, maybe you should think that uh, if I have this positive semi-definite matrix P, it's not that P can be written as Q times Q. No, it's going to be written as Q star Q. So this is maybe some motivation why this is the proper definition. And now the question is, what is the the proper notion of positivity when we look at non uh, non-commutative things. Right? And here we start with an example and we say, you know, I have an element in this free polynomial algebra. So free polynomial algebra means there are no relations between variables, so they don't commute. And these are like standard um, finite sequences of, uh, of coefficient times some polynomial. And then I'm going to say that such an element A is positive, First of all, if it is uh, self-adjoint, that's one thing. And the second thing is that if I take any star representation of this algebra, so that means that for every variable, I prescribe a matrix. Okay? And then I can evaluate this representation on this element, which means I take coefficients, which are complex numbers. I take those monomials, and I replace them with those matrices or products of those matrices. And then I get an honest matrix at the very end. So then I can say this matrix is positive semi-definite. Okay, is it clear? And here there is a small miracle, because this is really a miracle, uh, that Hankel proved that A in this free polynomial algebra is positive in it, if and only if belongs to this sum of squares. And you might ask, wait, so we started with polynomial things, and in polynomial things, we know that there exists polynomials which are positive, but are not sum of squares. So why this, this seems to be you know, a stronger statement, right? Any idea why? Because in polynomial algebra, the only assignment to those variables of matrices that we should consider are the diagonal ones. There are very few representations of the polynomial algebra. Right? All variables commute, so they are all some direct sums of one dimensional. But here, this positivity statement actually is much stronger. So of course, if we, start, if we require something much stronger, then we get much stronger results. All right, so this is, this is what I said, that in, in polynomials, uh, you know, the we said that this, there, is, there is this uh, evaluation of polynomials, and evaluation of polynomials corresponds precisely to those one-dimensional representations when I want to evaluate my polynomial at a given point. All right, so finally, this brings me to the topic of what is property. So uh, the primary algebras that we will be dealing with are the group algebras for some finitely generated groups. And I'm going to assume that my, uh, my generating set is symmetric. That means that it contains all the inverses. 
Right. So what is this group algebra? Um, you can think of them as finitely supported functions from the group to the real numbers that are written commonly as finite sums with the value at a given group element followed by the group element. Um, the multiplication inside is convolution of two functions, which is a fancy way of saying, I take such a sum, I take another sum, I multiply everything by everything and group together. Uh, and the involution on this uh, group algebra is induced by taking G to its inverse and then uh, extending it linearly while preserving the, the coefficient. So you have a, I have something like this. I invert identity. Well, that's identity. I invert G. That's G inverse. I do nothing to coefficients and so on. And in such an algebra, there exists, for a finitely generated group, there definitely exists a Laplacian. And this Laplacian is going to, is, can be written very simply as an element of the group algebra. It's the size of the generating set times identity minus all of the generators. So you can talk about normalized one or no, unnormalized one. This is unnormalized one because it's not... Uh, a probability measure. So what I wrote, write here is not exactly correct, but up to factor, up to constant factor it is. It corresponds to, to some lazy random walk on the group. So one thing that we should uh, see immediately is that such a Laplacian is self-adjoint. Okay? I assumed about that my generating set is symmetric. So whenever I apply star to any of this G, it becomes another element of the generating set. So this is fine. The second thing that might be not so easy to see is that this guy is already a sum of squares. Okay? And this corresponds, well, this follows from a very simple, maybe this is overly complicated, but basically if I see something like this, G minus G minus G inverse, this I can write as 1 minus g star 1 minus g. Okay? Because 1 here is actually this element of degree 2, whatever degree means in, in the group algebra. Right? So it looks like it's linear function, like a polynomial that would be a linear polynomial, but in group algebra it's actually no. Right? And then this is a... a maybe a stupid remark, namely if I take this expression, delta minus lambda identity, so that's like an eigenvalue problem, and then I project it onto, onto delta again. This guy is going to be non-negative, well, definitely for lambda equal to zero, right? Because for lambda equal to zero, this guy is going to be delta square, which is the same as delta star delta. Okay. So this is maybe a, a, a stupid remark, but I make it to, to say that this is zero and this is non-interesting, but if there exists an, a lambda that is positive, that is going to be very interesting. Okay. Because such a lambda will be, I mean, I'm calling such a lambda the universal spectral gap of delta. Why? Because if I take this delta and I represent it through any representation of my group, then this lambda is going to be the lower bound for the spectral gap in this representation. And finally, we have the definition of property T that is for this lecture. I mean, it is a definition, but this one is tailored for this lecture. So we say that G has property T, if and only if there exists a finite symmetric generating set, that's what we have, and the lambda which is strictly positive, such that this element is non-negative as an element in the maximal C star group algebra. So for those of you who know what C star group algebra is, that's fine. For those of you who don't, it's a completion of the group ring. It's a completion with respect to some norm that comes out of those representations. 
it's not really that interesting or not, it is a very interesting, but not very important for this lecture to understand really this, uh, this completion. But you have to understand that this, this, uh, this positivity comes from, uh, from evaluating those, uh, uh, those uh, representations. Then there is a, a theorem that is essentially started uh, all of this research that I'm, this, I'm describing today. is a theorem of Naru Takaozawa in 2014, where he said that uh, delta square minus lambda delta is non-negative in C star uh, group algebra, if and only if the same element is non-negative as a group ring considered as a group ring element. And then what he actually proved, what was the, the most important thing, was that delta square minus lambda delta can be written as a sum of squares as, uh, well, up to a, some small perturbation. Okay? And all of those three conditions are equivalent to themselves. Okay? So what is this small perturbation? You have to think of this small perturbation as follows. So the whole thing is my vector space, Rg. And inside it, there is a cone of sum of squares. Okay. And now I take, there is some topology here, called algebraic topology, corresponding well to the vector space uh, the vector space we are in. And now I take a un uh, order unit, which is uh, an interior point of this cone in this topology. And um, the problems here are that positivity can be also experienced at the, at the border of the cone. Okay? And then what happens is that if I take this uh, order unit, an internal point of this cone, and I perturb this element just a little bit in the direction. This is u, and then this is this is some psi, and this is psi plus epsilon u, and it becomes an honest sum of squares. Yes. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. So, um, for this, it's enough to look at, not at, at unitary representations, but at orthogonal representations. And you can build Yeah, and I think that that here the, uh, the non-negativity with respect to unitary is the same as as on the level of the group ring. It's the same as uh, uh, with with you. unitary and orthogonal are, uh, positivity is the same. But I'm actually not sure. No, no, order unit, okay, so order unit is a name. Order unit. Okay, so it's not, it's not unit in the, in the algebra. Order unit is just a name for saying it's an internal point uh, uh, of the cone. So the cone gives you some, some order you can say that one, two elements, one is greater than the other if the difference is positive. So that means it's in the cone. So that is why it's called order and unit. I'm actually not sure. So order unit is a different name for, for the internal point. Hmm? So you can see here it's the same. Well, it's not the same, but it's, it's a similar story. There is some notion of positivity 
and then we change it into some notion of analytic positivity, and then we change it into some notion of algebraic structure. Okay, maybe maybe that's the maybe maybe that's the. So here, yes, there is some any that means that whatever order unit I find it should be equally good. But yeah, with this maybe we should maybe there is an assumption that there is some norm. Yes, a Dirac identity will be good. Yes. So. And maybe there is a slide that is going to, um, to say why this one is not the one, the good one. Uh, but, uh, but in particular, we see that this is property T. And then we see that this guy is going to be uh, sum of squares. Okay? So this is the sum of squares we'll be looking for with some appropriate U. Right? So maybe there is not a slide with. I want to say, but maybe I actually don't know how much time I have. Not so much. All right. So uh, property T, more examples. Uh, so we know that SLN Z has property T. That's a standard example. And then there was a question of uh, a special automorphisms group or automorphisms group of the free group, which is a non-commutative analog for SLN. And uh, it was proven relatively quickly that uh, S out F3, does, S, out F2, S out F2 is essentially F2, so it does not have property T. But S out F3 uh, was proven to have infinite quotient of, of S out F3 has uh, uh, an infinite abelianization. So it was proven by Matt Cole. Um, and then there was uh, this question if the S out of N has property T that was repeated over and over again over the years. And in 2017, with Piotr Novak and Narutaka Ozawa, we found a constructive and computer-assisted proof, according to the, the lines I gave you, um, that S out of 5 has property T. And then in 2018, with uh, Piotr Novak and David Kielak, uh, we proved the, um, we lifted the, this this fact to to higher ends. This is something that Piotr will be talking about. Uh, but there is some very interesting recent development in 2020 and 2023. Martin Nietzsche, a colleague of mine from KIT, uh, he actually right now has a, a very recent proof that S out of N has T for almost all N without using computer. And here you have the, the reference to this paper. All right. So why do we even bother about the property T for this particular group? Um, well, first of all, why do we bother about property T? There is a connection between the expanding family of so, graphs and residually finite groups with property T. Namely, we can construct one from the others. Uh, the unbounded size grows comes from the uh, the, sequ the intersections of the groups going to, to identity. Uh, bounded degree comes from the fact that we have fixed sets of generators. And the spectral graph of the Laplacian uh, is bounded away from zero uniformly because this lambda is going to be this bound. Okay. Um, but also, there is a different motivation that is particular to property T and automorphism group of the free group. Namely, if we are after random group elements in finite groups, there exists an algorithm called product replacement algorithm, which is some form of a random walk. And we can prove that this random walk, uh, the mixing time of this random walk can be estimated using this lambda for this uh, special automorphism group. Okay? And you should maybe ponder this statement a little bit because there is this one group with one lambda that tells you how quickly all the random walks are going to, uh, to, to converge to the uniform one for all finite groups generated by n elements. Okay, so this is a very strong, very peculiar statement. Right? And it was observed for a long time that this uh, product replacement algorithm has fast mixing time. 
All right. So this is the overview of the algorithm. We start with our uh, finite, uh, finitely generated group uh, with G and S. Then we pick some monomial bases. So this is a set of, of group elements. For example, we can pick a, a ball of radius D. And then we form this, uh, uh, this uh, positive semi-definite problem when we want to maximize our lambda with lambda greater than zero and P to be positive semi-definite such that uh, this guy, delta square minus lambda delta is equal to this vector matrix vector product. So we write this one as a quadratic form. And uh, this looks exactly the same as in polynomial case. The only thing that is different is that the linear constraints are somehow different because now they are no, no longer commuted. But that's a technical part. And after we've done this, we look at the square root of, of, this, of this P that we found, and we look at the columns and as, or rows, depending on the transpose or not. And as previously we have seen, those guys gives us uh, vectors, which are coefficients in the bases, so we can re uh, reconstruct the sum of squares decomposition. And this were so simple, but reality is not so simple. So when we solve this problem numerically, this is never equality. So this is only up to some small uh, discrepancy, and now we have to deal with this. All right. So how do we certify that this numerical solutions uh, give us the, the actual result. Okay. So uh, uh, this is based on, on, a, on a lemma that was made uh, explicit or quantitative by Netzer and Tom. Namely, if we have this cone and we have an element R here, which is very close in the in the one norm uh, neighborhood of our cone, then we know how much do we need to push it in the direction of lambda so that it ends up inside the cone. So that means it is a sum of squares. Okay. So it's a statement about dominating a small element in norm L1 norm by the delta. Okay. And if you look at this picture and you think, oh, this is, this is obvious, well, then you may, maybe you want to look at this cone. And then maybe this is what L1 neighborhood. And if you have R here and delta here, maybe this vector will be of infinity. Right? But here, this is kind of uniform. It's not called uniform convexity, but it has this, this, uh, this flavor. Inside. Okay? So therefore, if we have a small R, so small discrepancy in L1 norm, then uh, we can modify the sum of, well, modify the, the objective and then dominate the, uh, this, uh, this discrepancy uh, by some subtracting some delta. Okay? So then we know that, del that delta has not spectral gap of lambda, but actually lambda minus this constant times uh, norm of the discrepancy. Um, right, so then we have to, uh, to modify uh, our algorithms because now we reconstruct the sum of squares up to some small discrepancy, and then we have to modify uh, what we claim, right? So now we say that you know, we no longer claim that lambda is the, the spectral gap, but we have to say there is some lambda that is uh, is greater than this. Okay. This is still not correct, but maybe I'm going to skip this one because I'm running out of time. Okay. So here's a baby example. Uh, if we start with uh, the group of uh, SL3Z and we look at the ball of radius 2, uh, the generating set are the elementary matrices, then I look at the, this matrix with some ordering of rows and columns, which corresponds to some group elements. And this matrix is a proof that SL3Z has property T with lambda equal to well, 0 
All right, so there are a few numbers. Uh, namely, we can prove uh, SL3, 4, and 5 rather easily with pretty high lambda compared to what was known. So what was known before for, for SL5z was something like This was a result by, Mar uh, by, by Martin Kasabov. Uh, so this is a substantial um, gain. Um, but when we tried the same philosophy for S out of four, we got zero, which might mean anything. Well, maybe the, the basis that we have chosen was, was wrong. The subspace where we are looking for this, this basis. But when we tried S out of five, Actually, it, it turned out that uh, we couldn't actually solve this because it was too large, right? Um, so then we thought there must be a better way. And of course, there is one because uh, when we have this group, this uh, uh, generated by the set of all transvections or elementary matrices, if you want, uh, then the original problem is to realize this one as sum of squares uh, semi-definite optimization problem, which gives us this one huge positive semi-definite constraint and um, 11 millions of equality constraints. But then you look, realize that there is a finite group, namely this one, the vial group, acting on this, uh, on this uh, vector space. And you could decompose this space into the irreducible summons. And this PSD constraint, which is a matrix, right? It's an equivariant uh, operator that fixes uh, this space. So you can use Wedderburn decomposition to simplify this one huge PSD constraint. And then it turns out that there are 29 blocks of uh, where the largest is 58 by 58. Right? And if you think about complexity, uh, what we are doing when we are solving the PSD problems, we are doing eigenvalue decomposition. Eigenvalue decomposition, uh, uh, the algorithms are O of n to the cubed. So when we um, make 4,000 to 58, it's um, 1 billion times faster from the complexity. Okay, and now it turns out that you can solve this problem in five minutes to high precision. And this is precisely, this is the proof uh, of Piotr Novak and Narutaka Ozawa that out of five fit property, right? So just to give you a sense of scale, so this was the, the final optimization uh, problem. We are only looking at those values along the diagonal. This is the 58 by 58 block. And the original one was of this size, right? We are looking only at this small part. Um, and maybe I can just show you one last slide, namely uh, the problems with this approach uh, are the following. It's a black box solution. So we put it into the solver, solver gives us a huge matrix. And then we analyze this matrix to make sure that this gives us an honest solution, but we do not understand the solution. We know it's there. So it's kind of existence uh, statement. Uh, we, we actually well, try to, to learn something about the solution. We know much better, much more than we, than we used to in 2018. Uh, but maybe more important is that it seems to, to be like once per group solution, right? So you give me a group, I can compute this, it's, uh, it's uh, successful, and therefore we have property T, but you give me another group, I have to compute again. And this one will be addressed by Piotr in his talk because uh, uh, the proof that out of uh, N uh, has property T is based on some kind of induction where we can actually localize what needs to be proved to out of five or SL3Z. And out of this one computation, we can derive the proof for all uh, out of Ns or for all SLNs. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions from the audience?
Yeah, so so here it seems that you know you I start with, with the group SL3Z. I look at this Laplacian or Laplacian this one. I prove this this happens, so that means that I I've written sum of squares decomposition. Okay. But now what happens if I move to SL4Z? Like, can I use the old one to, to derive the new one, right? A priori on face value, there is no reason why the same thing for delta four Why should this be related to this one, right? So every time you start with a new group, I have to do a new computation because those xi i's might be completely different, maybe unrelated to this. Okay. Mm, but what we what we proved in in uh, in the in, in this article, which uh, which Piotr will be discussing, is that there is actually a way to to relate one to another. And, and what is even more interesting, there is one computation that you can do in SL3Z, which is not exactly this one, but a different one. But you can still, out of positivity of certain element here, you can derive property T for SLNZ for every other N. And the same thing goes for out of N, and that's why this article is in existence. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It's preserved. So yeah, so it's uh, it's stated as um, as a uh, well, special automorphism group, but it's the same. It leaves to to, to out of n, and also it leaves to any extension. Maybe what is what was not here clearly visible is that it leaves too much more in the sense because I only look at a finite dimensional vector space of the uh, of the group algebra. So if I can find a different group which has isomorphic subs those subspaces. And by isomorphic I mean not only as subspaces but also partially defined multiplication, so partially defined algebra structures, then you can lift one sum of squares decomposition into another one. So therefore, this, this um, statement actually works not only for SLNZ, but also works for the Steinberg group, because we only use those few relations that are visible in small balls. It's not the standard way you lift property T, but here it is possible. Um, like taking, for example, Z of T. Is this the question? Ah, um, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but the, the question was, can we replace this R by something else, right? Yeah, this I don't know. This I don't know. I actually never thought about it. Any further questions? There are none. Let's thank the speaker again.